I welcome you to the face-to-face -face facilitation of NSC2OSIS, which is biochemistry. I remain Arego K. Juliet Feolua. I've been your online facilitator for this course. And today is a re the revision for this course. During the online facilitation, we were able to discuss nine study sessions, out of which we discussed the introduction to biochemistry, we discussed chemistry of carbohydrates, we discussed chemistry of protein and amino acids. We also discussed the chemistry of lipids. We went ahead to discuss chemistry of nucleic acids, after which we had an overview of carbohydrate metabolism, which includes glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, glycogenesis, and glycogenolysis. And lastly, we were able to discuss isomerism. So in this face-to-face -face facilitation today, I will try as much as possible to cover most of the aspects which has been outlined. Now to introduction to biochemistry. That was the first thing we discussed. What is biochemistry? The word biochemistry is from the word biology and then chemistry. That means it is formed from biology and chemistry. Biochemistry is the study of structure, composition, and chemical reaction. Of substances in living systems. The word biochemistry was they were able to define biochemistry as a, the study of chemical processes in living organisms. Biochemistry is the application of chemistry to the biological processes at the cellular and molecular level. Like I've said, that it comes from biology and chemistry. It involves studying the structure and the behavior of the complex molecules found in biological material and the way these molecules the interact to form cells, tissues, and the whole organisms. As you all know, that if, before you can have a complete human tissues, before they, they will now form organs that will make a whole system. So these cells, they are made up of atoms. And what are atoms? Atoms, atoms are the smallest chemical component of our body. If you remember your, chem your chemistry in your secondary school days, you remember that you were taught atoms. And what are example of atoms? Like you have oxygen, you can have oxygen atom, you can have hydrogen atom, nitrogen atom, carbon atom, and so on. So there are different atoms. These atoms, they unite to form cells. And these cells will, will unite to form tissues. The tissues will unite to form organs before you have the whole human being. Then there's what we call biomolecule. Biomolecule. We are, Biomolecules are an organic molecule, which are important for cell survival. A molecule is just a group of uh, atoms. Example of um, molecules are glucose, amino acids, vitamins, and so on. But when we say biomolecule, they are biological molecules that are loosely used, which is a loosely used term for molecules and ions that are present in organisms. And uh, they are very important for their survival. And there are four major classes of these biomolecules. We have carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and uh, nucleic acids. All these four molecules are what we are going to look at in this course. Before I go on, I would like to tell us what is the role of biochemistry, because I discovered that many nurses are not really interested in biochemistry. You ask yourself questions, why am I doing this course? Then that is why I have to tell you the importance of this biochemistry to you in, in, in your, as, as nurses. Biochemistry is used in clinical diagnosis. It is used to manufacture various biological products. It is used in treatment of diseases. It is used in nutrition and it is used in agriculture. And in relating this to nursing, vast majority of our patients are humans. And I have told you how human beings, how, how they are formed from atoms to cells to tissues to form organs, then to form the whole system. Most, the, uh, uh, most of our patients, they are usually human. And women are biological organisms that live in a rich soup of uh, chemical interactions. Knowledge of chemical nature and reactions of biomolecules, which is biochemistry that we have defined, is essential to understand health and diseases. Biochemistry helps to study bacteria, viruses, and other organisms to better understand the chemical basis of life. Our medication work is directly related to biochemistry. 
Antibiotics, for example, as you all know that we have uh, uh, antibiotics, you are all familiar with antibiotics, and what is their mode of action? Some can be bacteriacida and some can be bacteriostatic. It is this knowledge of biochemistry that will help us to study these bacteria, these viruses, and all other organisms to understand their chemical basis of life. Biochemistry has also helped to understand, to, to determine the effect of chemicals on medical problems. That is in relation to pharmacology. If not for the knowledge of this biochemistry, we will not be able to understand how these chemicals, how they work with uh, diseases such as uh, cancer, aging, and uh, obesity. Also, biochemist, biochemistry in nutrition, it, it also helps to analyze food products to help us to measure their vitamins, the, the protein level, the, the carbohydrates level, and minerals. And you will all agree with me that this is very important to you as nurses. We have to know the, 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 the analysis of the food that we give to our patients. Our patients. If bachelor of nursing programs are omitted, if bachelor of nursing programs have omitted the key fundamentals of biochemistry like this, nurses will not have understanding of how, how, how such common things, such as uh, acute critical illness, trauma, surgery, cardiac arrest, uh, fever, and so on, how they have affected our patients. And that will take us to chemical elements of life. Going back to your chemistry in your all level days, you remember that you were taught about different chemical elements and more than about 25 types of elements are essential to life, out of which six of them are very most important and they are very common. And these six are known as the CHNOPS elements. The C stands for carbon, the H stands for hydrogen, N stands for nitrogen, the O stands for oxygen, P stands for phosphorus, and L for sulfur. All these are the building blocks that constitute our organs and the muscles. And this will take us back to biomolecules. I have defined biomolecules uh, as molecules that are found in living matters. And I said we have four biomolecules. We have the carbohydrates, we have lipids, we have proteins, and the nucleic acids. The carbohydrate is made up of elements of atoms that are carbo carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And what do they do? They provide energy. We all know that carbohydrates, even if you ask a primary school student, they will tell you carbohydrates gives energy. So what makes up the carbohydrate is the carbon, the hydrogen, and the oxygen. And what is the monomer of this carbohydrate? The monomer is what we know as monosaccharide. An example of monosaccharide is glucose that we are all familiar with. Another biomolecule is lipid, which is also made up of the same elements as that of a carbohydrate. That is the carbon, the hydrogen, and the oxygen. And what is their function? The lipid helps to store long-term energy to make up cell membranes. And the ammonoma comes in form of fatty acid and glycerol. Also, we have another biomolecule, which is protein. Protein is made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And their function is they, 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 they help in growth and repair. The speed of chemical reactions in the body. And the monomer comes in form of amino acids. And the last but not the least of the biomolecules is nucleic acid which is formed from carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And their function, we all know nucleic acid, they are, they are of two types. It can come in form of DNA, and it can come in form of RNA. The DNA carries hereditary information, while the RNA makes up protein. And the monomer of nucleic acid is what we know as nucleotide. So throughout this course of revision, we'll, we'll look down into the chemistry of all these biomolecules. And that will take us to the chemistry of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are a very, a, a very common class of a simple organic compound. And it can come in form of an aldehyde or a ketone that has additional hydroxyl groups. Carbohydrates are synthesized by photosynthesis, and it is used as a source of energy by animals. It is the largest source of energy in our daily diet. We all know what we consume most is more of carbohydrates, and carbohydrates also perform some other functions. The carbohydrates are a group of naturally occurring carbonyl compounds, which can be aldehydes or ketones, and they also contain several hydroxyl groups. The simplest carbohydrates are called monosaccharides and they have the basic structure of CH2ON, where the N can be three or greater than three. The carbohydrates which are soluble in water and sweet in taste, they are, they are known as sugars. 
And carbohydrates consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those are the elements that make up carbohydrates. There are organic compounds organized in the form of aldehydes or ketone, and they have multiple hydroxyl groups. A monosaccharide can be polyhydroxy aldehyde, and they can be polyhydroxy ketone. Like I've said, they can come either in form of aldehydes or ketones. What is the structure of carbohydrates? Carbohydrates can be structurally represented in any of three forms. They can come in form of open chain structure, they can come in form of hemiacetal structure, and you can have what we know as award structure. For the open, straight, open chain structure, it's just a long straight chain of carbohydrates. For the hemiacetal structure, it's just a, in, in the hemiacetal structure, you see the first carbon of the monomer, which condenses with the hydroxyl group of the fifth carbon. It will now form a ring structure. That is the hemiacetal structure. Then for the Howard structure, it is usually due to the presence of what we know as piranose ring structure. What do I mean by piranose ring structure? It's just any cyclic isomer that has five carbons and one oxygen in a ring of six atoms. So that is it about structure of a carbohydrate. And we move to physical properties of carbohydrates. What are the things you can see physically with carbohydrates? The first thing is carbohydrates exhibit what we know as stereoisomerism. In our further discussion, we will still discuss what isomerism entails. Stereoisomerism means when compounds are, when, when, compare, when compounds, when they share the same structural formula, but they differ in their spatial configuration. That is what makes it stereoisomer. An example is glucose. For example, in glucose, you can have big glucose and you can, you can have L glucose. They have the same structural formula, but they differ in their spatial configuration. Then another physical property of carbohydrates is what we know as optical activity. Optical activity is the rotation of plane polarized light forming either positive or negative. That is why we can have positive glucose and a negative glucose. When we talk about optical activity, it's just the ability of a substance to, rate, to rotate the plane of polarization of a beam of light, which passes when it passes through heat. And carbohydrates, they have the property to rotate the plane polarized light, either to the right or to the left. And when it rotates to the, to the right, it is termed as dextrorotatory, and that is when we have the positive sign. When, is, when it is rotated towards the left, it is known as level rotatory, and that is when we have the negative sign. So we can have, when you say we, you have D glucose, that means it is positive. And when you say you have L glucose, it is negative. So there we have the, the optical activity is represented by the positive or the negative sign. Another physical property of carbohydrate is what we call stereoisomerism. It's just the configurational changes with regard to the second carbon, the third carbon, or the fourth carbon in the structure of glucose. Where we have example is in man mannose and, and galactose. When we talk about di diastereoisomers, it's just the type of isomer that has non-mirror images. They are stereoisomers with two or more organic compounds, and they have at least two stereocenters with different configurations at some of the stereocenters, but the same configuration at the others. And the last property, the last physical property of a carbohydrate is what we know as anomerism. That is the spatial configuration with respect to the first carbon atom in adoses. You know, I said carbohydrates can come in form of adults or ketones. If it is in adults to exhibit anomerism, there will be special configuration in the first carbon atom. And if it is in ketones, the, the, configura the special configuration will come in the second carbon atom. That will take us to chemical properties of carbohydrates. The first one is oxazone formation. When carbohydrates, when they react with, uh, when you have carbohydrates reacting with an uh, excess of a uh, phenylhydroxine, they form glucosazone. So they form oxazone. That is the, one of the chemical properties of a uh, carbohydrate. 
And another chemical property, property of carbohydrates is uh, what we call Benedict's test. We are all familiar as nurses. We are all familiar with this Benedict test of testing glucose. That is what we normally use. When you hit, when, when you add glucose to urine and you hit it, it will produce, it will produce color changes, which comes in form of orange color, red or brick red color. So that is a chemical property of a carbohydrate. When a Benedict reagent is added to heat and it is heated, it is reduced and uh, it, it brings out color changes of uh, the orange red color and the brick red. Another chemical property of carbohydrate is what we know as oxidation. Most carbohydrates, especially the monosaccharides, which are the commonest, they are reducing sugars. And if their carbonyl groups, if they, they, they are, they, their carbonyl groups oxidize to give what we know as carboxylic acid, in the Benedict test, the D-glucose is usually oxidized to D-gluconic acid, and glucose is then considered to be a reducing sugar. Another chemical property is reduction to alcohol. The carbonyl groups in open chain forms of carbohydrates can be reduced to alcohol by sodium borohydrides. And that will take us to classification of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates can be classified into different types. We can have, it comes in monosaccharides. You can classify it as disaccharides. You can classify it as oligosaccharides and polysaccharides. For the monosaccharides, it means they have just one sugar molecule. For disaccharides, it has two sugar molecules. For the oligosaccharides, it has about two to 10 sugar molecules. And when you have more than 10 sugar molecules, it is termed polysaccharides. Example of monosaccharides is glucose, fructose, and galactose. Example of disaccharides is sucrose, lactose, and maltose. Example of oligosaccharides is raffinose and starchose. Then for the polysaccharides, we have examples like starch, glycogen, and cellulose. For the monosaccharides, they are the simplest group of carbohydrates, and they are often called simple sugars, since they cannot be further hydrolyzed. It's, it is usually colorless, it is usually crystalline solid, which are soluble in water and insoluble in a non-polar solvent. These compounds, they, they, they possess free aldehyde or ketone groups. When we have monosaccharides with, more than with, uh, with three carbons, they are known as triosis. And when, they ha when you have them in, with four carbons, it's known as tetrosis. When you have five carbons, you can say they are pentosis and so on like that. So the commonest examples are the glucose, the fructose, and, and the galactose. Then for, when I said, when we have uh, about two to 10 sugar molecules, we call it oligosaccharides. And they are just monosaccharides that are joined together by the, what we know as glycosidic linkage. We can have examples like uh, the raffinose and the statues, like I've said. Then these polysaccharides. We are all familiar with, with uh, starch. Starch is an example of polysaccharides, and they have they contain sugar molecules of more than ten uh, monosaccharides units. So they, they, on hydrolysis, they yield more than ten molecules of uh, monosaccharides. And these polysaccharides they can be they can come in form of homopolysaccharides. That is, they contain monosaccharides of the same type. And when they, they can also come in forms of uh, heteropolysaccharides. That means they contain monosaccharides of uh, different types. We have examples like the, for, the, for the homosaccharides, which is the, very, the most common. The examples are the starch, the glycogen, and the cellulose. But for the heteropolysaccharides, we, you can have examples as a uh, chondroitin and um, hyaluronic uh, acid. That will take us to chemistry of um, amino acids. Proteins are large molecules, complex molecules that are critical for the normal functioning of the human body. And they are essential for the structure, the function and regulation of the body tissue and organs. Proteins are made up of hundreds of smaller units called amino acids. Amino acids are the monomers of um, protein. And they are attached to one another by what we know as the peptide bond, which makes it to form long chain. You can think of protein as a string of beads, where each bead is an amino acid. So we, as we all know that 
proteins are very important in the body. And um, human, human beings can, can synthesize only about half of the needed amino acids. But the remaining amino acids must be obtained from our diet. That is why we can have essential amino acids and non-essential amino acids. The ones that must be obtained from our diet are known as essential amino acids. Why the, the ones that our body synthesize can be non-essential amino acids. And what are examples of amino acids? Amino, example of amino acids can be glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, phenylalanine. We are, phenylalanine is very common. My, my, most time when you buy your food product, just check, they will write this food product contains phenylalanine. Phenylalanine is just an example of uh, amino acid. And we have some people that, re, some patients that react to phenylalanine. So when you know that the food content contains phenylalanine, you don't give to patient that reacts to it. So let's go to classification of um, protein. There's no universally acceptable classification system for protein. However, protein can be classified based on composition. And when you classify it based on composition, you can classify it as either simple protein or conjugate protein. You can also classify protein based on dissolubility. And this will be a, this it needs to be classified as either albumins, globulins, and histones. You can also classify proteins based on the shape of the protein. And this is classified into fibrous protein and globular proteins. You can also classify protein based on their biological function. So you can classify protein to be either an enzyme, you can classify it to be a protective protein, storage protein, structural protein, transport protein, or different types of protein, depending on their biological function. And that will take us to the structure of protein. Protein can be represented in four types, in four different structures. You can, you can structurally, protein can, come, can have primary structure. It can have secondary structure. It can have tertiary structure, and it can have tertiary structure. For the primary protein structure, as you can see on your screen, it is just a sequence of a chain of amino acids. For the secondary protein structure, you have hydrogen bonding of the peptide backbone, which causes the amino acid to fold into a repeating pattern. That is when you have the secondary protein structure. And for the tertiary, it is just a three-dimensional folding pattern of protein structure, which is due to a side chain interaction. And the catenary structure, when you have protein consisting of more than one amino acid chain, you can say it has catenary protein structures. What are the med biomedical importance of protein? Protein are, are the main structural components of the cytoskeleton, and they are sole sources to replace nitrogen in the body. As you all know, nitrogen is very important in the body. Protein is also a biochemical catalyst known as enzymes, and uh, we have classified that under the, the under the classification of protein, some protein can come in form of, they serve as the first line of defense against bacteria and viral infections. We all know the importance of protein, why we incorporate protein diet into our patient's diet. So several hormones are also proteinous in nature. Structural proteins like actin, actin and myosin that are, that are found in the muscle fibers. They are contractor proteins and they help in the movement of uh, muscles. Some proteins also present in cell membrane. They are, they, they are present in cell membrane, the cytoplasm and the nucleus of the cell, and they act as uh, receptors. These receptors, they are very important in the, in, the, in the mode of action of drugs. Drugs must bind to receptors before they can bring out, uh, they, they can exhibit their, their actions. Also, the transport proteins, they carry out functions of transporting specific substances across the membrane or in the body fluids. And that will take us to amino acids. I said amino acids are the monomers of proteins. Amino acids, they are molecules containing an amine group. The amine group is NH2. It also contains a carboxylic acid group. It contains a side chain. The side chain is usually denoted as R and they vary depending between different amino acids. The key element of an amino acid is we have protein, 
hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. We have the general formula of amino acid. And the R, don't forget, I said it, it normally denotes the side chain. The amino acids are usually colorless, they are non-volatile, and they are crystalline solid. They melt and decompose at temperatures above 200 degrees Celsius. You have the structure of the amino acid displayed on your screen. Each of these amino acids, they have four different groups attached to the alpha carbon. The alpha carbon is the carbon in the middle, and it is attached to the four, four, four specific, four different groups attached to it. You have the carboxylic acid group, you have the hydrogen atom, and you have the side chain, which are attached to the to the carbon, the alpha carbon atom. And that will take us to chemistry of lipids. Lipids are organic compounds, which are formed mainly from alcohol and fatty acid, and they are linked together by extra bonds. You have, as, as you have this, in the presence of uh, exterase, which is lipase, to form lipid. The difference between fat and oil is that Oil is a type of lipid which is liquid at room temperature. White fat is a lipid which is solid at room temperature. We are all we are always saying fat and oil, fat, fat and oil. The fat is usually solid, while the oil is liquid at room temperature. Lipids are, are one of the main molecules that are needed in the body to maintain proper health of, of, of the human body. And out of all the important functions it performs, the most crucial one is to build the cellular membrane. As energy, it protects and also carries out cellular communication. There are some diseases associated with an abnormal chemistry of or metabolism of lipids. You have obesity, atherosclerosis, diabetes mellitus, hyperlipoproteinemia, and so on. So that is why most times when patients come to the hospital, you, you know, we normally tell them to carry out lipid profile tests. There's, there's a reason why they carry out lipid profile tests. So this, this revision is telling us the reason why patients carry out lipid profile tests, to know the abnormal chemistry or metabolism of these lipids. Lipids are molecules that contain hydrocarbons and they make up the building blocks of the structure and function of the living cells. Lipids are a necessary part of the healthy diet, and the function of lipids within our body are many. Like I've said, they carry out insulation properties, they functions, they store energy, and so on. They provide uh, the essential fatty acids. Fatty acid is a carboxylic acid with a long chain aliphatic chain, which is either saturated or unsaturated. And the saturation is based on the number of double bonds. If, the, if, if there's a single bond between the carbon and the carbon atom, we can say it is uh, saturated. And when we have double bond or triple bond, we can say it is unsaturated. Most naturally occurring fatty acids, they have a um, branch chain of an even number of carbon atoms from, that ranges from two to 34. And it is that carboxy group that makes it to be an acid. That is when we have carboxylic acid. The spread on your screen is the structure of saturated and, and unsaturated fatty acid. Where we have single carbon to carbon, where it is called saturated. And when you have double bonds or triple bonds, it is known as unsaturated fatty acid. And examples of unsaturated fatty acids are oleic acid, linolic acid, alpha linolic acid, gamma linolic acid, and so on. Therefore, the saturated fatty acid, you can have lauric acid, palmitic acid, steric acid, and so on. And that will take us to saturated fatty acids and unsaturated. We have to explain. Like I said, the saturated fatty acid lacks double bond between the individual carbon atoms. While the unsaturated fatty acid, there's at least one double bond in the fatty acid chain. For the saturated fat, they are usually from animal sources. Why unsaturated fat are usually from plant sources? And the general formula of the saturated fatty acid is CN, CH2N plus one with the carboxyl group. The first member of this group is the acetic acid. That's an example of a saturated fatty acid. 
Saturated acid can be further grouped into short chain and long chain saturated fatty acid. It is short chain when it, when it has about two to 10 carbon atoms, and it is long chain when it has more than 10 carbon atoms. The short chain saturated fatty acid can be volatile and can be non-volatile. The volatile short chain fatty acid, they are usually liquid in nature and they contain about one to six carbon atoms. They are soluble in water and volatile at room temperature. An example of this uh, volatile short chain acid, acid, butyric fatty acid, caproic fatty acid, high short chain fatty acid. They are usually solid at room temperature and contain about seven to 10 carbon atoms. They are usually soluble in water and non volatile at room temperature. An example of this non volatile short chain fatty acid is the caprylic acid and a capric acid. Then the long chain fatty acid, they contain more than 10 carbon atoms and they occur in hydrogenated oils. You can find them in animal fats, you can find them in butter, you can find them in coconut and in, in palm oils. And examples of this long chain fatty acid are the palmitic acid, stearic acid, and lignoceric acid. They all have their molecular formula displayed on your screen. And that will take us to unsaturated fatty acid. Unsaturated fatty acid is a long chain carboxylic acid that contains one or more carbon, carbon, carbon double bonds. It is classified according to the degree of unsaturation as either monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acid. For the monounsaturated fatty acid, they have only one double bond, while the polyunsaturated fatty acids, they contain two or more double bonds. Yeah. The molecular formula of both monosaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids are displayed on your screen. And that would take us to classification of lipids. Lipids can be classified into simple lipids, compound lipids, and derived lipids. For the simple lipids, it can come in form of fat and oil, and it can come in form of waxes. We are all familiar with waxes. It's waxes wax is an example of a simple lipid. And for the compound lipid, we have phospholipids, we can have glycolipids, and you can have sulfolipids. An example of phospholipids is lecithin, cephaline, plasmologen, and so on. For the glycolipids, you can have cerebrosides as example. Then for the derived lipids, it can come in the form of alcohol, fatty acids, steroids, and isoprenoids. Looking at the types of lipids, we'll discuss wax. Wax is just an example of simple lipids, like I've said and it contains fatty acids that are joined together to a long chain alcohol, like 12 to 32 carbon atoms. Waxes are usually insoluble in water, and they are not easily, they are not easily hydrolyzed as fat and oils. The fat and oil, they are just triester of fatty acids with, the glycerol, with, with glycerol, and triglycerides that are solid or semi-solid at room temperature, like we have said earlier on, they are known as fat. And those that are liquid are known as oil. Those triglycerides that are that, like oil, they are usually they usually you usually find them in plants. They originate chiefly in plants, although triglycerides from fish are also largely oils. Phospholipids and phosphatides, they are compounds of lipids that contain phosphoric acid in their structure. It is this phosphoric acid that is attached to them that makes them to become phospholipids. And that will take us to the chemistry of nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are nucle polynucleotides. That is, they are long chain molecules that are composed of series of nearly identical building blocks called nucleotides. When, it, when you hear the word nucleic acid, what should come to your mind? What will come to your mind is DNA and then RNA. Those are the two types of nucleic acid. The nucleic acid, like I've said, they are made up of the nucleotides. And each of these nucleotides consists of nitrogen-containing aromatic base, which is attached to a pentose sugar, and which in turn attached to a phosphate group. Each of these nucleic acid, they are made up of nitrogenous bases, which can be four or five, depending on the type of nucleic acid. For the, nitrog for the nitrogenous bases, 
we have denim, which is represented as A. You can have guanine, represented as G. You can have cytosine, represented as C. And thymine, represented as T. And lastly, uracil, which is represented as U. The adenine and guanine, they are categorized as purines. And the cytosine, the thymine, and the uracil, they are collectively known as pyrimidines. Nucleic acids are the main information carrying molecules of the cell. And by directing the process of protein synthesis, they determine the inherited characteristics of every living thing. Like I've said earlier, the two main classes of nucleic acids, they are the DNA and the RNA. The pentose sugar in DNA is known as deoxyribose sugar, while that of the RNA is known as ribose sugar. Without an attached phosphate group, the sugar attached to one of the bases is known as nucleoside. Here is the structure of the purine bases and the pyrimidine bases. Like I've said earlier on, the adenine and guanine, they are known as purine nitrogenous bases. Why uracil, the thymine, and the cytosine, they are known as pyrimidine bases. You have the structures of each of, the, of, the, of these nitrogenous bases as displayed on your screen. What are the components of nucleic acid? I said there are two types of nucleic acid earlier on. We have the DNA and we have the RNA. For the, for the components, the nucleic acid are made up of a nitrogenous basis. They are made up of sugar and phosphate group. For the DNA, DNA contains only thymine. DNA contains adenine, guanine, and cytosine. But for RNA, the nitrogenous bases in RNA, they are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. The sugar in DNA is deoxyribose sugar, and that of RNA is ribose sugar. Both DNA and RNA, they all have the phosphate group. That is the component of nucleic acid. The first nucleic acid that we discuss is DNA. DNA is known as deoxyribonucleic acid and is the chemical name for the molecule that carries genetic instruction in all living things. The DNA molecule consists of two strands that wind around one another to form what we know as the double helix structure. The double helix structure was discovered by Watson and Crick. They are the first set of people that discovered this uh, double helix structure known as DNA. And DNA is a very large molecule made up of long chain of subunits called deoxyribonucleotides. Don't forget, I said DNA means deoxyribonucleic acid. These deoxyribonucleotides, they attach to each other. They attach to each other by phosphodiester bonds. And each deoxyribonucleotide is composed of deoxyribonucleoside and the inorganic phosphate group. The deoxyribonucleoside is made up of the nitrogenous bases and the pentose sugar. And we all know that the like, nitrogenous bases, like I've said, they are made up of the purine and the pyrimidines. What are the types of DNA? We can have circular DNA and we can have non-circular DNA. For the circular DNA, it's just the DNA that forms a closed loop and they have plasma. And example, this circular DNA, they include the plasmids, they include the mobile genetic element. For the non-circular DNA, is a DNA that has two non-identical ends, of which the three prime end and the five prime end, they, they form and they, to, they, they go together. So they are non-circular. You have the three prime end going and the five prime end also going on its own. This type of DNA is found in, in, in varying amounts in various recombinant and defective mutants. You can find it in a Escherichia coli. What are the functions of DNA? DNA is used to store genetic information. It's used to store the codes for protein. And you know these codes, they are the ones that exhibit the traits that human beings they display. So when you see a particular trait in someone, they are, that is why we, call, we said traits are inborn. It is because of this DNA. They are found in this gene. These traits are found in the DNA of that individual. And in the cytoplasm, DNA meets up with the with ribosome and this, where they synthesize protein. DNA also helps to maintain growth and repair. DNA controls all cellular activities in the body. Displayed on your screen are 
example, are the structure of the circular and the non-circular DNA. Looking at the structure of DNA, we can have what we know as the primary structure of DNA and we can have the secondary structure of DNA. The primary structure is the order in which what amino acid is bound the order with a peptide bond. It is coded for the order of codons in genes. For the secondary structure, it is how the chain on amino acid, how they interact with each other to form beta barrels and uh, alpha helices. And the structure is determined by hydrogen bonds between different amino acids. And that will take us to ribonucleic acid, RNA, which is the second type of nucleic acid. RNA is a biologically important type of molecule that consists long chain of nucleotide units called ribonucleotide. And RNA is found in the nucleus and the cytoplasm of the cell. It has linear and single strand of a nucleotide, unlike the DNA that is a double stranded. The RNA contains ribose sugar and the nitrogenous bases of uh, adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. There are differences between RNA and DNA. Looking at the the at this on looking at your screen, we have some features that differentiate both DNA and RNA. For the nitrogenous base of uracil, uracil is absent in DNA. Meanwhile, it is present in RNA. And the type of sugar present in DNA is deoxyribose sugar, while that of RNA is ribose sugar. DNA is usually found in the nucleus, the mitochondria, the nucle the, the ribosome, the cytosol, the cytosol. The RNA is found in the nucleolus and then the mitochondria. And the DNA, I said, is two helical strands. Why? RNA is single strands. There are different types. You can have, apart from the circular and the non-circular DNA I said, we can have a DNA as type A, type B, and type Z. But the most commonest one of the DNA is the type B. The, the types of RNA, they can, you can have transport RNA, messenger RNA, and ribosomal RNA. They all have their different functions. DNA carries genetic information, why only in uh, messenger RNA carries genetic information? Others do not carry genetic information. DNA can synthesize RNA by transcription, and usually RNA cannot form DNA except by reverse transcriptase. For the number of bases in DNA, they are equal. Why that of RNA, they are not equal? And that will take us to carbohydrate metabolism. So far, so good. We have been able to discuss biomolecules. I have discussed biomolecule of carbohydrate, biomolecule of uh, protein and amino acid, the lipids, and that of uh, nucleic acid. And now we'll go into the metabolism of the biomolecule carbohydrates. Carbohydrate metabolism is a fundamental bio biochemical process that ensures a constant supply of energy to living cells. The digestion of food carbohydrates, such as the starch, the sucrose, the lactose, which I have cited examples earlier on, they pass into the bloodstream. And the study of this uh, the synthesis of carbohydrates is known as anabolism, while the study of its degradation is known as catabolism. So for the two, the study of both anabolism and catabolism is what we know as metabolism. So metabolism combines both anabolism and catabolism. The most important carbohydrate, which is glucose, can be broken down via glycolysis. We'll discuss glycolysis as we move on. And this, when it is broken down by glycolysis, it will enter into the Krebs cycle and the oxidative or phosphorylation to generate ATP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate, which is a source of energy used by the cell. The first one we look into is glycolysis. Glycolysis is the process of breaking down glucose. And glycolysis can take place either with oxygen or without oxygen. Glycolysis produces two molecules of pyruvate. And this, the, two, the two molecules of ATP, it also produces two molecules of NADH and two molecules of water. Glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm of the cell. And there are 10 steps involved in this glycolysis making use of 10 different enzymes. 
This is the process of glycolysis. For, for the gluco glucose is broken down to glucosis phosphate by the exokinase enzyme. The glucosis phosphate is acted upon by glucose, the phosphoglucose isomerase enzyme, which produces fructose C phosphate. This fructose C phosphate is acted upon by phosphofructokinase enzyme, and it produces what we know as fructose one sinks by phosphate. And this is broken down into DHAP and G3P. You know, I said glucose, uh, the carbohydrates can come in form of an aldehyde or ketones. G3P means glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Why DHAP means dihydroacetone phosphate? These are acted upon by glucose 3 phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme to give us 1,3 by phosphoglycerate enzymes. It is further acted upon by the kinase enzyme to produce 3 phosphoglycerate enzyme, which is further acted upon by the mutase enzyme to produce 2 phosphoglycerate enzyme. The 2 phosphoglycerate enzyme is acted upon by enolase enzyme to produce phosphoenopyruvate which is further acted upon by the pyruvate kinase enzyme to produce pyruvate. And that is the summary of everything that happens during glycolysis. The next thing is tricarboxylic acid cycle, which is also known as citric acid cycle. We are all familiar with uh, citric acid cycle, right from uh, our chemistry in uh, O-level days. Citric acid cycle is the same thing as tricarboxylic acid cycle. It's a series, and it's also known as Krebs cycle. Is a series of uh, chemical reactions that is used by all aerobic organisms to release stored energy through the oxidation of acetyl CoA, which is derived from carbohydrate, which can also be derived from fat and protein into, a, a, into adenosine triphosphate and uh, carbon dioxide. The Krebs cycle is a strap pathway into which many metabolites feed. It consists a number of reactions which generates NADH and FADH2, which, are, which can in turn be used by the, the oxidative phosphorylation pathway to generate ATP. The, tri the tricarboxylic acid cycle occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria in the cell. And here is the pictorial representation of the, tri uh, of the Krebs cycle. In the Krebs cycle, Happens form which, uh, which is acted upon by the citrate synthase to form the citrate. The citrate is also acted upon by the aconitase uh, enzyme to form the isocitrate. On, on and on like that till it forms till it gets to the uh, L matate L matate to secrete L matate. So going around like that is the, what we know as the Krebs cycle. And for each of this, this cycle, it produces two molecules of carbon dioxide, three molecules of NADH, and three hydrogen ions, one molecule of FADH, and one molecule of GTP. And as such, each molecule of glucose produces double of this. And that will take us to glycogen metabolism. Glycogen is a readily mobilized storage form of glucose, and it is very large. It is branch polymer of glucose residue that can be broken down to yield glucose molecules when energy is needed. Most of the glucose residues in glycogen are linked by the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds. The controlled breakdown of glycogen and release of glucose increase the amount of glucose that is available between meals. Hence, glycogen serves as a buffer to maintain blood glucose levels. Glycogen is the major storage form of uh, carbohydrate in animals and they correspond to starch in plants. And it's, it occurs mainly in the, in the liver. The synthesis and degradation of gly glycogen, they are carefully regulated so that sufficient glucose is available for the body, for the body's uh, energy needs. Glycogen's role in maintaining blood glucose level is especially important because glucose is virtually the only fuel that is used by the brain. The synthesis is what we known as glycogenesis, and its breaking down is what we know as glycogenolysis, 
And both glycogenesis and glycogenolysis, they are controlled by three hormones. That is insulin, glucagon, and epinephrine. Those are the three hormones that contain glycogen synthesis, glycogen synthesis and glycogen degradation. So we have insulin, glucagon, and epinephrine. And the first one we look at is glycogen synthesis, that is glycogenesis. And displayed on, displayed on your screen are the steps involved in a glycogen, glycogenesis. Glycogenesis is just the formation of glycogen from glucose. And glycogen is synthesized depending on the, depending on the demand for glucose and ATP. If both are present in relatively high amounts, then excess of insulin promotes the glucose conversion into glycogen for storage in the liver and the muscle cells. The glucose, if it is in the muscle, it is acted upon by exokinase enzyme. And if it is in the liver, it is acted upon by glucokinase enzyme to produce glucose 6-phosphate. This glucose phosphate is acted upon by phosphoglucomutase enzyme to produce glucose 1 phosphate. This is further acted upon by the UDP glucose pyrophosphate phosphatase enzyme to produce UDP glucose, which is further acted upon by glycogen synthase to produce alpha 1 4 glucose units. This is acted upon by the branching enzymes to now form glycogen. So these are the steps involved in glycogen synthesis. And this will take us to glycogen degradation, which is known as glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis is the breakdown of the molecule of glycogen to glucose, which is a simpler sugar that the body uses to produce energy. Glycogen branches are catabolized by the sequential removal of glucose monomers via phosphorolysis by the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase. Epinephrine, like I've said earlier on, that three, um, three hormones are involved in both glycogenolysis, said include insulin, glucagon, and epinephrine. So epinephrine, which is similar to glucagon, they have to stimulate glycogenolysis, which is the degradation of glycogen in the liver. And this results in the raising of the level of blood glucose. However, that process is generally initiated by what we call the fight or the flight response, as opposed to the physiological drop in and the blood glucose level, which will stimulate a glucagon secretion. In um, glucagon is uh, released from the pancreas in response to low blood sugar, and the uh, epinephrine is released in response to a threat or stress. That is the fight or the flight response. And both glucagon and the NFA, they have phosphorylase to begin glycogenolysis and to and inhibit glycogen synthesis or to stop glycogenesis. Here are the steps involved in glycogenolysis. We have glycogen, we have glycogen, which is uh, acted upon by glycogen phosphorylase enzymes to produce glucose 1 phosphate which is further acted upon by phosphoglucomutase enzyme to produce glucose phosphate in the muscle, and then which is acted upon by glucose phosphatase enzyme to produce glucose in the liver. And this will take us to gluconeogenesis. What is gluconeogenesis? Gluconeogenesis is just a process of synthesizing glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. And the starting point of gluconeogenesis is the pyruvic acid. Although oxaloacetic acid and then the adroacetone phosphate also provide the entry point. So the, 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 the beginning of a gluconeogenesis is the, from the pyruvate, which we now go around to produce glucose. So pyruvate will lead to production of phos uh, phosphoenol pyruvate which we further leads to production of a fructose 6-phosphate, glucose 6-phosphate before it now produces glucose. Gluconeogenesis occurs mainly in the liver with a small amount, also occurring in the cortex of the kidney. With, a, with very little gluconeogenesis, it occurs in the brain. Little gluconeogenesis occurs in the brain. It's also, little also occurs in the 
muscles or other body tissues. In fact, this for little gluconeogenesis takes place in them. Therefore, gluconeogenesis is constantly occurring in the liver to maintain the glucose level in the blood to meet this demand. And this will take us to the last aspect of our discussion today, which is known as isomerism. What is an iso? What do I mean by isomerism? Isomerism is just a phenomenon in which more than one compound, they have the same chemical formula, but they have different chemical structure. What do I mean by this? For ladies that produces beads, when you are producing beads, you know, you can have different types of beads. You can have color red bead, you can have color white bead, but you want to make the sign. When you want to make the sign of this bead, okay, you want, the total number of beads you want to use is 20. You can decide to have 10 of color red and 10 of uh, color white, depending on how you want to make your design. You can take, okay, you can say you want to take two of color red bead and put one of color white in between and later on go along and mix color red and mix color white, depending on how you have decided to mix it. That is the same phenomenon applies to what we know as um, isomerism. In isomerism, you have the same chemical formula. That is the same amount of the total number of, of the bead is the same thing, but their structure is different. You can decide to make different design from this bead. So that is the phenomenon of uh, isomerism. So in isomerism, chemicals, they have the same chemistry, the, the compounds have the same chemical formula, but they have different chemical structures. Chemical compounds that have identical chemical formula but differ in properties, and the arrangement of atoms in the molecules are known as isomers. And there are two different types of uh, isomerism, which can also be further classified. The two major types of isomerism are the structural isomerism and stereo isomerism. Like I have said, they are further classified. The structural isomerism can be classified as chain isomerism, you can have positional isomerism, you can have functional isomerism, you can have metamerism, tautomerism, you can also have ring chain structural isomerism. However, for the stereo isomers, they can be further classified as either geometric isomerism or optical isomerism. For the geometric isomerism, it means they are isomers that differ in their spatial arrangement about a double bond. For the optical, it means they are isomers that differ in the arrangement of atoms in the 3D space, which create mirror images of each others. I'll go ahead and discuss these types of isomerism. Isomerism or isomers, they are as chain isomerism. What do I mean by chain isomerism? They are just compounds that have the same molecular formula, but they differ in the order in which these carbon atoms, they are bonded to each other. An example of these include butane and isobutane. For the structure of butane, you have the structure of butane on your screen and also the structure of uh, isobutane. For these structures, they have the same molecular formula. If you look at the carbon and the hydrogen atom that are involved, they have the same molecular formula, but their structures are different. So the first one makes butane and the second one makes an uh, isobutane. And that will take us to the next type of uh, isomer, which is the uh, positional isomers. Positional isomers have the same molecular formula, but they define the position of a functional group on the carbon chain. For example, example is uh, the two methyl butane and the two two dimethyl propane. You have the structures on your on your screen. The in the position isomerism. The carbon skeleton, they remain unchanged, but, import, but important groups, they are moved around, around on that uh, skeleton. That is uh, when you have the two methyl butane and you have the two, two dimethyl butane. So it's just the position that changes to make it a um, positional isomer. Then the functional isomer, they have the same molecular formula, but they define their functional group. For example, Looking at the example 
color your skin. You have ethyl alcohol and dimethyl uh, dimethyl is the um that makes it different. So in the functional isomers, they are common substances when they have the same molecular formula, but they have different uh, functional functional groups. Then another type of um, structural isomerism is what we know as uh, tautomerism. For tautomerism, it means when two structural isomers, when they are mutually interconvertible and they exist in dynamic equilibrium, they are called tautomers. And the phenomenon is called tautomerism. So it's just the most common form of a tautomerism is the keto and tautomerism. Here we have the carbonic compound containing at least one alpha hydrogen atom, which is, which is converted to an enol by the transfer of an alpha amerism. Then you can have what we know as a metamerism. Metamerism is another type of a structural isomer, isomerism. And in this type of isomerism, is due to an equal distribution of carbon atoms on either side of the functional group. Such compounds are members of homologous series. Example is the diethyl ether and the methyl propyl ether. So you have these, the, the structural formulas displayed on your screen. In the metamerism, different akai groups, they are attached to the same functional group. And the example is the diethyl ether and the methyl propyl ether as seen on your screen. Then the other type of uh, isomerism, apart from the structural isomerism, is the stereo isomerism. Stereoisomerism is a form of isomerism in which molecules have the same molecular formula and sequence of bonded atoms, but they differ in the three-dimensional orientation of the atoms in space. In stereoisomerism, two molecules are described to, to be stereoisomers. If they have the same atoms connected in the same sequence, but the atoms are positioned differently in space. And there are two types of this uh, stereoisomerism. You can have the geometric and the, the optical isomerism. For the stereoisomerism, two molecules are usually described to be stereoisomers if they are made up of the same atoms and they are connected in the same sequence. But the atoms are positioned differently in space. So these are the this is the structure of a butane that can come in the form, in form of a cis and the trans butane. The geometric uh, for the geometric isomer, stereo isomerism, they are the cis they are the cis trans isomerism, and they occur when double bonds is present. An example is uh, the when you have one two dichloroethane. The optical isomerism, of a, which is a type of stereoisomerism, they are formed when asymmetric centers, when they are present. For example, you have, when you have a carbon with uh, different groups that are bonded to heat. We have come to the end of our discussion. Thank you all for your time and your attention. I wish you the best in your exam. Thank you. Thank you, our able facilitator, for this beautiful presentation. Now it is time for a question and answer. Please don't just put your hands up. We can't take more than five people. This particular facilitation is clear enough. So if you have any further questions, you can reach your uh, facilitator later. So I will just take five people, then we call it a day. Adeni Yabimbola. Fumi Akanji. Okay. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Okay. I want to ask a question. When she was talking about where glucose can be metabolized, she was she she talked about the liver, little from the brain. But I didn't get the rest because my network was not good. So that's my question. Okay, offer to you, facilitator. Okay, thank you. 
the way I was talking about little in the brain was uh, in gluconeogenesis. That is the generation of uh, glucose, synthesis of uh, glucose. I was talking that in gluconeogenesis, that it happens majorly in the liver. And it also happens in the cortex of the kidney. However, very little of this process takes place in the brain, in the skeletal muscles, in the heart muscles, and in other little, little of this takes place in the brain. But you all know that brain needs glucose. But little of this process takes place in the brain. So that was where I was talking about uh, uh, glucose. I, I was talking about gluconeogenesis there. Okay. Have I answered your question? Elisa, your question. Joy B, your question. Okay. Um. Hi, good afternoon. Hold on, ma. Can you hear me? I hear you. Okay, ma, I actually have two questions. Okay, the first one is, um, this um, slide you just made, is it possible we get it in our email so we can just go through it? Because I think this is more concise than the, um, lecture, the lecture notes. Okay, thank you for the question. The slide is deducted from your study materials. And you have the study materials both online and a copy. So you can go through it. Okay. You can even prepare your own slide yourself. So okay, okay. No. This one is just the summary. Add this one to the one you have online. It's okay for you. You can even go online and search more. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Infinite or five. Your question. All right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I appreciate the lecturer. It was a good one. But Ma, can you please go over the lipid again? The lipids. Hello? Hey, you, what exactly do you want to know about lipids? Well, everything on that is not that clear to me. I wouldn't know if you can go over it again. The carbohydrate is clear to me and uh -huh. the lipid as the body lipid. You can just go over it, man. You should Hello? have a specific aspect of the lipid that is not clear to you. Hello, I can hear you well. Yes, I said lipid is just an example of uh, it's, it's one of the biomolecules that we have in biochemistry. Yes, ma'am. You remember I said that? Yes, ma'am. So I talk about uh, advantages of uh, lipids to the body. I talk about the formation of lipids. I talked about the diseases that can be associated with uh, abnormal lipids. I also talk about fatty acids. So I don't know which one exactly do you want me to re-emphasize again? It is the fat and oil. When you made about, uh, you talked about the phospholipids and then the composition of the triglycerides and others. Okay. Hello. Yes, ma'am. I mean the composition of the triglycerides and the phospholipids, ma'am. I was not. I, I didn't go into the. I took. I didn't go into the composition of triglycerides fully. Okay. I was talking about fat and oil. That I said fat they are solid at room temperature, while the oils are the ones that are liquid at room temperature. Okay. So I talk about the classification of lipids which was divided into simple compound and derived lipids. And I gave you examples. Fat and oil are examples of simple lipids. The phospholipids that you were talking about, the examples of compound lipids and so on. Okay. You get that? Ma. Yes, ma, I can get you, ma. Any other question? Okay, NS206, your question. Good morning, ma. Good morning. Well done, Good ma. Quiet. Okay, my question is, please, ma, can you 
explain more on Krebs cycle and the difference between RNA and DNA. I don't understand when I read the manual. Please, just more light on this. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Okay, it's not like take it back again. On my slide, I I gave you differences between uh, RNA and DNA. So when you are talking about RNA and DNA, going through the slide again, I was able to differentiate RNA and DNA. So these are the differences between RNA and DNA. I talked about their differences based on the, the presence of a nitrogenous versus the types of sugar, their location in the cell, their location in the cell, the number of strands they have, the types they have, the genetic information, and so on. So this table, and this table was gotten from your manual. So you have it in your study manual. Please go back back and study it well. It was lifted directly from your manual. So your second question is talking about the Krebs cycle. Where in the Krebs cycle is it that you do not understand? This is the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle, like I've said, is there are series of chemical reactions whereby it leads stored energy. And I told you it's, a, it's just a circular pathway. And it is a way where many metabolites where they feed. And I've been able to cite what happens during the, uh, the Krebs cycle. I said it's the same thing as the tricarboxylic acid cycle. It's the same thing as um, the citric acid cycle. And what during during this cycle, in this all the in this reaction that I said, each of this cycle will produce two molecules of carbon dioxide. And it's also in the Krebs cycle, you have three molecules of NADH, three hydrogen ions, and one molecule of FADH. Also, you have one molecule of GTP that will, that will be produced in the Krebs cycle. So you can still go ahead and read more from your manual about uh, the Krebs cycle. Victor, can you ask your question? Okay, yes. we'll see Victor. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, man. Uh, Okay, you don't have questions. Good morning, Thanks for the link, you We are appreciating you. My question is on that. You explained that I don't get to understand the metabolism and the. I can't hear you. You did not, you did not get what? You do not have a good network, so I can't hear you. Any other question, please? Ajayi Oluwa, your question. Okay. Hello, thank you very much, sir. Uh, while you are explaining uh, on the circular and uh, non circular DNA, the audio was. Can you speak very... louder, please? Can you speak louder? Yes, I just want uh, more explanation, sir, on a uh, circular and non circular DNA. Okay. Circular and non circular DNA, they are just types of uh, DNA. I also said, you know, apart from the circular and non-circular DNA, I also mentioned some types of other DNA. I said we have A DNA, B DNA, and Z DNA. Hope you remember that. So from the word circular, as you can see the structure on your screen, the circular DNA, they form closed loops. 
and they do not have end. That is what makes it circular. And I gave example of where, where you can find this type of DNA. You can find it in plasmids. And for the non-circular, as you can see from the shape, it has two non-identical hands. It has the three prime hand and the five prime end. So it is not circular, just from the word circle. And I said you can find this type of uh, the non-circular DNA in um, a sterichia coli. Okay. Have I answered your question? Yes, thank you very much, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Um, we have come to the end of today, uh, fascination for NAC2 osis. So we meet in by 3 p.m. for DST uh, 122. That is communication in this too. So have a lovely day. If you have any further question, you can contact your uh, facilitator through the SMS or LMS. You can also call her. Thank you and have a lovely day.